This is a video dealing with Act 5, Scene 3 of Macbeth in depth. Now, Act 5, Scene 3 is one of the most important scenes in Act 5. It's very bitty. It seems to deal with quite a lot of different things and move between it. But it really is the whole point of, uh, of it is to see Macbeth at this stage, how he is coping. Um, it's the first scene in Act 5 where we come across him. Um, so the last time we saw him before this was in Act 4, Scene 1 with the witches. So this is a chance for us to see how he is coping, how he's getting on with things. And basically, um, leading into the end, what situation is he in at this point? So, as you said, it's quite bitty. It moves between various things. First of all, he tells his followers not to bring in any more reports and speaks aloud about his invincibility. Then he mocks a messenger for being pale-faced and spitting fear. He reflects then on the impacts of his actions. He puts his armour on, uh, far too early, as one says, uh, and he discusses the condition of Lady Macbeth with the doctor that we saw at the beginning of the act, uh, and then asks him if he can cure Scott of his illness. There's lots of different things going on. We're going to focus it in on a few of the key uh, big issues here. As usual, it's the two central characters and their relationship and then the ideas of the supernatural and its impact and influence ambition and loyalty uh, and the dichotomy between them uh, gender in terms often of masculinity in particular in a play that's so heavily focused on men and kingship and mm -hmm. how um, people actually serve as now although ambition and loyalty and gender uh, masculinity both come up uh, and are a part of this the key things I think to notice are obviously Macbeth as a character, that's going to be central to this the elements of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's relationship that I mentioned is only very brief but it's very important um, well the relationship Macbeth has with the supernatural at this point and how he is as a king Now, elsewhere in um, the videos uh, on the YouTube channel, you'll find a, uh, a masterclass lecture from me uh, in which I discuss Macbeth in Act 5, and particularly my idea that what's happening in Act 5 is that following on from the witch's prophecies, which have left him to believe that he is invincible, what we have is we have a conflict between Macbeth the king, and let's face it, he is not a good king at all. Uh, Macbeth the soldier, because he returns very much because he's having to fight here to being that soldier that we saw at the beginning, that brave, fearless soldier. And that at the heart of it, what it resolves itself in is the beginning of a more philosophical outlook. And we see elements of this, all of these in this scene. At the beginning here though, what we see is a combination of the bravery uh, and confidence of the soldier coming through in terms of him as a king and not necessarily to good effect. So having claimed he's going to ignore all of the reports, um, and the reports obviously uh, at this stage, it never says what they are, but I, because he then follows up, uh, by talking about fly false thanes, it seems to be the reports that link with the previous scene of thanes leaving him and going elsewhere. So he is taking the supernatural element, the interference, the the ideas that has been given from uh, uh, from the prophecies of the witches above any kind of political uh, analysis at all, ignoring the reports and instead saying that he cannot taint with fear until Burnham Wood removes the Dunstone. Now, I've identified there how significant the phrase cannot is. It's not will not. He's literally suggesting it's impossible for him. So he's got to that stage in him where he's almost suggesting he's not in control of his own emotions. He continues this theme on by pronouncing, having mentioned Burnham Woodrow and Dunstanane, mentioning that Malcolm wasn't born a woman. 
with the spirits that know all mortal consequences of Sebastian, which shows you the intense confidence that he has in the witches at this point, something that will not be lasting very long. Within two scenes, he'll be beginning to doubt them. Um, but at this stage, they know everything that has to do with mortality. Now, just as interesting, I would think, at this point, is the fact that he is openly saying this in front of the Doctor and a bunch of attendants. This is not a soliloquy. I mean, quite what you'd make of it if you were stood there and Macbeth started, talk the king started talking about, I can't take with fear until the wood attacks uh, this castle, or uh, what the problem with Malcolm, wasn't he born a woman? I don't know quite what you make of it, but it shows the level of confidence he has that he's no longer hiding anything. He's bringing this all into the open. And it all comes to the conclusion at the end that he doesn't care about the thanes leaving and mingling with what he refers to as the english epicures uh, you know knocking their masculinity a little bit it's because his mind and his heart he goes by here his mind will never sag with doubt his heart will never shake with fear okay never never so he's referring to, I mean, you know, we, there's been a lot of conversation leading up to this with him about how he will, the first things of his heart will be the first things of his mind, for example. So he's not going to think through things. And his conclusion here then is that there is no doubt ever going to come into his mind, there is no fear ever going to come into his heart. Now, bear in mind the amount of fear there was earlier in the play in here, and twice now he has suggested that there is no fear at all and it will come back in a few scenes time in act five scene five is that purely because of the confidence of the witches or is that the journey that he's come on has he as he becomes the soldier again is all fear gone was he just out of place in committing an assassination you know that's not very soldierly was that his issue but anyway, this is then juxtaposed by Shakespeare with the entrance of a servant where he takes this confidence and immediately applies it to him, insulting him. Here are just a few examples of goose look, cream face, loon, devil damn me by. But he carries on repeatedly, lily liver boy, linen cheeks, way face, all aggressive and personal insults but focused on the idea that he is showing fear. So fear is the real focus at this point. So I think we think about a number of things there. As I said there, the impact that he is speaking so openly. Think about that for him as a king, but also for him as a person. Think about how he's considering the supernatural, how he feels about the supernatural at this point. Maybe consider why as well. And then this repetition of talking about fear at this particular moment. As I said, do always remember earlier in the play, Macbeth being overcome by fear. If we move to a second key moment in here, you see this is, this is the beauty of this scene. The first bit, it just seems a little bit like, well, okay, Macbeth's confident, he is ready to take on anything but then we move into this now i mean if you look at the list of people on here technically uh the attendants haven't left the room but it definitely has the feel of a soliloquy here um so i would take it as such and i think it would be fine to do so this reflection on his life that comes in I, it, it is so unexpected as to be almost shocking, I would think. Look at that as an opening phrase. I, you know, this is literally after he has just finished insulting that servant and telling him to get out. Get out. But he just comments, "I've lived long enough." Now, I, I mean, you know, whether he's actively saying, "I'm ready to die." or whether he's just reflecting on, as he comes along, the idea that his way of life is going towards it. I don't know. I mean, this thing goes on here, this lovely image of 
um, his way of life falling into the sea of a yellow leaf, falling into uh, autumn. You know, the leaf is yellowing, it will soon be dead. My way of life will be as well. It doesn't say my life, but my way of life. Seeming like he's a person out of time, the way he's living. I mean, it falls in with something that Shakespeare does quite a lot in a number of his plays, particularly in his um, tragedies, where there's a kind of looseness to the idea of the passage of time. What seems to have happened quite quickly can often be seen to happen over a length of time. And he's not too worried about any plot inconsistencies that uh, come as a result. Hamlet in Hamlet um, goes from being a young student to being pronounced at the end of the play, uh, it being his 30th birthday. Um, we have this same kind of thing here. It seems to be suggesting that Macbeth is ageing now. Now, whether that means he's been king for a long time or whatever, I don't think we need to concern ourselves with. But what I think is important is that he's attaching this idea of ageing to the idea of his way of life moving out of, um, of place. And that means he's suggesting, possibly at the same time at this point, that the way of life wasn't the right way to go, especially considering he follows it up with this phrase about what should accompany him in his old age. He realises he can't have. And then draws up in comparison what he gets. So instead of honour, honour, love, obedience and troops of friends, what he gets, instead of honour, he gets curses. Right? Not loud, but deep. He gets mouth honour. So he does get honour, but he knows it's not meant. He knows he gets cursed instead of loved. He knows he doesn't get it out loud people are too scared to do it to him the thing he replied he, he returns to in a minute about um uh, breath words that the uh, um, from people that their heart would want to deny but dares not he understands the fear that's there that stops him speaking out loud but he knows that underneath their heart does not go with it underneath the curses are deep they run deep he knows he's hated he knows that the only rule he has here is through fear. Fear, that thing that he came to at the beginning. Which is the complex relationship with fear, doesn't it? The idea that at the beginning he was disdaining people for having fear. But understanding at this point is the only thing he has to rule by. Now once again this is full of juxtaposition. This is juxtaposed immediately with uh, Seton entering. And confirming all this about it about the huge english army coming towards him and this in contrast i'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked so on the one hand i've lived long enough i understand the only reason i'm in power and keeping on power is fear but at the same time i'm going to fight till the death macbeth as a poor king Macbeth as a brave, valiant soldier. The conflict between the two resolving itself in Macbeth's philosophising and understanding that the time has come. He'll fight till the end. Now, even though he's just been saying, I'm invincible, I'm invincible, I know I am, he's still talking about fighting till his flesh be hacked. And, you know, I mean, that's a really quite unpleasant image the flesh being hacked from his bones but maybe suggests that that's the way he likes to see that's the way his death would be for him as a soldier the perfect death for him so you've got to think that is there a change going on in in our response to Macbeth at this point he you know you could argue he's been lacking a lot of empathy for a while now are we now starting to understand and get empathy now if he feels what he says at the beginning as well, we need to consider, then why does he say what he does at the end? Link the two together. They, they can't exist on their own. And then think about the picture of him as a king. In this, quite detailed one, his exchange with the doctor. Uh, at this. 
First of all, what we see is he begins by talking about Lady Macbeth and appears to be incredibly flippant about her. Now, bear in mind, we have not seen him speak about his wife uh, or have any anything to do with his wife since the end of the Banquo ghost scene. Where the tenderness still seemed to be there, even though he wasn't particularly listening to it. But now he refers to her as your patient. He doesn't refer to her as his wife, as the Queen, as Lady Macbeth, as a patient. And more so, your patient. Putting the responsibility for her onto someone else. When told how, how bad her state is, his response is just cure of that. Completely dismissive. Okay, he wants her cured, but there doesn't seem to be a great deal of emotion. Now, is this suggesting a change, or is this again that Macbeth as soldier that we've come to see? The one who's not allowing fear and therefore not allowing other emotion potentially to come into things at all? Well, he does follow it up with what seems far more poetic. Can you not minister to a mind disease plucked from the memory of rooted sorrow? Now that seems, and we get the same uh, uh, two scenes later in Act 5, Scene 5, where the initial dismissiveness is followed by something a little bit deeper and a little bit more thought through. If she's got a diseased mind, can you, do not, can you not do anything about that? Can you not pluck out that rooted sorrow? As he goes on to say, cleansing her of the perilous stuff that weighs on her heart. So maybe that dismissiveness isn't his feelings about her, just the way he is being at this point. When the doctor uh, uh, responds to say that's the patient's responsibility, he then says, "Throw physic to the dogs." Then, you know, the, the kind of medicine that you know that the, the doctor practices. Well, if you can't do that, if you can't cope with this, I don't want any of it. You could suggest that line, as well as being quite aggressive and throwaway and showing the sense again of the, of the soldier in him. That could be a sense of despair, couldn't it? She can't be cured. Well, I don't want any of your physical things. You can't cure her. That's all that matters. There's final call. But then he turns to the doctor, repeats that the fangs are flying, and we get this very interesting element here. The first and probably only time I think in the play when he shows care and concern for his country above himself. Asking the doctor, or saying he wishes the doctor could find the disease that his country is suffering from. The disease of Scotland. That he, if he could do that and could fix it, purge it to a sound and pristine health, then, then that would be worth applauding. It's a small little bit, and Macbeth is full of these, that throw away things that aren't mentioned again. But it can't be ignored. Is Macbeth regretting how poor a king he is? Is he wishing that it could be better? So, we've got to think about the relationship, uh, where it is now. The attitude towards physic, as he calls it. And the impact of those final lines. As like I said, a very good, interesting, complex, bitty scene. We need to consider the Macbeth here and how he relates to what we've seen. We haven't seen him for a while. The biggest gap that Macbeth is not on stage by quite a way between uh, the witches scene and this. What are we seeing as different and is it purely down to what has happened with the witches it says in the supernatural there what impact are the supernatural having on his attitude and decision making is that the reason that he is what he is then to see the relationship why has it reached this stage and what in fact is the stage that it's reached and then you've got to ask yourself about kingship Maybe the phrasing in that question isn't great, presented as a better king than we give him credit for. I mean, no, he's an awful king, isn't he? But is he being presented as someone who cares more about being a better king? Maybe that's, that's the thing that we give him credit for. 
So we think about this in the rest of the play. As I said, Macbeth's character needs to be seen at this point in relation to where it has been. It's a very, very... Well, I wouldn't say very different thing. I'd, I'd say it relates very much to the Macbeth we've heard about but never met at the beginning of the play. Um, and it is a movement on from where he was in Act 3. With the relationship, again, is there any connection to that previous loving relationship? Well, I suggested there are moments in there, there are elements in there that might give you a sense it's not dismissing her. And the extent of supernatural interference, as we've been asking the second half of the play with the supernatural, is the point that it is influencing more? Or after Act 4, Scene 1, is the supernatural evil forces able to just take a step back and say, right, do your job for us, Macbeth? And then you can ask yourself, is there any way in which Macbeth is proving to be a better king than Duncan will. There's a, there's a question for you. If you can find something in there, that will be a very interesting one to me.